We have before us one of the uh, one of the great stories of the Old Testament, an uh, action-packed story, a uh, competition between God of Israel and and God of Jezebel. And so it's a uh, it's a familiar story if you um, maybe ever had it in Sunday school or or vacation Bible school as a kid, or, or maybe you just stumbled across it. In these few, ch few chapters in the First Kings that deal with Elijah the prophet, but it's a good story. It's a great story, and uh, it fits in nicely with what we're trying to do with looking at fire in the scriptures and to see what it reveals about God. And this story um, is no different. Um, we have fire here at the um, crux of the story, and fire being called upon from above. And we're going to see if it reveals to us anything about God. And I think what we're going to see together is that uh, it's one major thing uh, that we'll look at uh, maybe as three different parts. Um, but uh, it does reveal uh, something very, very important about God, our Lord. So basically, though, just a, a quick recap of where um, this story fits in our scriptures. Uh, just as a, a review, or maybe uh, for the first time. But basically, um, Ahab is king of Israel, and we're still in a time of the biblical history where we have a divided kingdom. And so we have a northern kingdom, which is Israel, and a southern kingdom, which is Judah. Jerusalem is the capital of Judah, and um, Samaria, I think, is the capital of Israel. But I'm not... I, might be drawing a blank on that. Um, but anyway, uh, so it's a northern and a southern kingdom. Ahab is the, is the king of the northern kingdom. And he, uh, if we were going to do a poll uh, for the all-time worst kings of Israel, there would be a lot to, that we could put up to the top. But Ahab would compete for um, one of the worst. He, he might be at the very top of the list. He was um, a terrible king when it comes to worshiping God worshiping the God of Israel, Yahweh. It wasn't unusual for a king to allow for um, worship of other gods. And so to um, allow, you know, whatever, God's little g in and, and not do anything about it. That was not unusual. Or to enter into an alliance with a foreign country uh, where they followed other gods. That was not unusual. It was bad, but it wasn't unusual. What makes Ahab um, a notch up in terms of, um, of his badness um, is that he not only uh, was following uh, Baal, um, Jezebel's god, um, but he was also issuing uh, the complete wipeout of anything that reflected worship of Yahweh. And so he was trying to tear down anything um, culturally and structurally uh, that would remind people about the God of Israel. And so he was just, he was in, um, in, in pretty deep with, with God. And in fact, the northern kingdom is going to ha have a hard time uh, recovering from Ahab's reign. Now, they're going to survive a few more um, generations, uh, and then they're going to be completely wiped out. Um, and so Elijah comes in on the scene uh, at, a, at a critical time. And he is um, one of the most powerful prophets um, that we have in the Bible. In fact, uh, there's three, one way to think of it, there's three all-stars of the Bible when it comes to miracles. Uh, Moses uh, being the first that we meet in terms of the power that he has from God uh, to make you know, the seed part and that kind of stuff. Uh, Elijah is the second, and he's going to do, or the Bible's going to highlight about eight of his miracles and we're in the middle of his second or third year. Um, and then, of course, in the New Testament, Jesus um, is going to be the ultimate miracle um, um, story in, in the Bible. And so that just shows you how important Elijah is. Now, as important as he is, he has a very modest um, introduction um, in the scriptures here. And that is, if we would have to just flip over... To, and I'm going to switch this. Did it sound a little funny? Or is it just me? Just me? Just me? Test it. 
Well, I always like this handheld mic because I feel like a game show host. So. <laughs> anyway, uh, he has a modest introduction in chapter 17. He just comes on the scene uh, as an adult, and we're told uh, that he is a prophet. Um, he, he is working for Israel's God, is the one that he serves. And he, right, I mean, within the first few verses that we meet Elijah, he, um, he announces to King Ahab, uh, he announces that um, there will be neither dew nor rain these years unless I say so. And so we haven't that. We don't know anything about Elijah. All of a sudden, he's on the scene, and he tells the king that uh, they're in trouble. And so you can imagine how well that goes over with King Ahab, right? All right, so it doesn't go over well with him. And so basically from those uh, first, that first verse of chapter 17, uh, basically uh, Elijah is going to be on the run uh, for, for the rest of his life, uh, running from here to there, uh, back and forth, um, um, speaking on behalf of, of God, and then running, and then speaking on behalf of God, and then running some more. And so that's, the, that's his life. Um, it's also, it gives us a clue that the, the many prophets that are going to come after him, uh, none of them are, are real excited that that's their job, that that's their calling. And Elijah's really no different. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. So basically, I encourage you to read chapter 17, um, because that's where we also get Elijah um, being fed um, at the brook and being, and, and being and given access to water and food there, being taken care of, actually. Uh, why he was there. Uh, by who was he taken care of? My Baltimore friends. The raven. The raven that's right. The raven um, took care of um, Elijah. So you want to read that. And then we have the widow from Zarephath. Um, the encounter there and a miracle uh, where he um, saves her son. Uh, so that's a story that you need to read as well. And then we get uh, to this story that was read for us. Chapter 18 is a long chapter. Um, but it sets it up where um, Elijah uh, has a word from God, and he says, enough is enough, basically, and um, it's time for you to choose. And so he looks at the, the kingdom of Israel and says, Israel has to choose. You can no longer live this way. Um, it's either Baal or the God of Israel. You can't do both. And uh, I know the right answer, uh, but you need to figure it out. And so he comes up with this, this contest. And it's a very interesting story, um, and we very detailed, that was read for us. Uh, but basically, as you want to think about it and visualize it, um, Elijah says, hey, there's 450 prophets on for the bad guys, and there's me for the good guys. And we're going to have a competition here, and you know we're going to see which guy is real. And so that's basically it. And, and it continues... It carries on from sort of what we talked about last week. They're going to have a sacrifice. We talked about uh, the burnt offerings last week in worship. Well, this is another burnt offering. And he's going to say, you're going to have your bull. I'm going to have my bull. And on the count of three, you're going to call on your God. And, and let's see what happens. And so nothing happens. And then eventually Elijah starts to mock them. And says, hey, your God basically... Is that your translation said he's out on a potty break, right? <laughs> so, what was that? The message? Or what was your translation? The Living Bible. The Living Bible. I like that. That was cool. Uh, but that, that captures it. Yeah, he's on a break. Uh, must be on a break. So Elijah starts to have fun with him, mess with him a little bit. And so then after they, you know, they've had all their, their time, they go through all this brick and more and uh, cut themselves and everything, nothing works. And so finally, when it's, uh, Elijah says, all right, let me take my turn. And the one, I won't repeat the whole story, but the, the one thing to highlight is I love how um, he calls on the water. He said, let's fill all this up with water. Uh, it wasn't unusual. That wasn't an unusual thing to have water there uh, as part of the sacrifice. But he says, let's just cover, let's make it obnoxious. Let's cover everything with water. Uh, and I like that because I think he's just saying, Let, let's make no mistake about this power, the power of this fire that's going to come down. Because uh, has anybody ever lately tried to light wet charcoal? <laughs> and how frustrating that is. So everything's wet. Just imagine. And, and my solution to that last week when I had some wet charcoal, which wasn't my fault, by the way. <laughs> it came that way. I didn't leave it out in the rain. Uh, but anyway, uh, I had lighter fluid. We just 
soak it with lighter fluid <laughs> near the house. <laughs> <laughs> and I took the match, and, and it was a spectacular scene. The fire, all of the neighbors could see it. Uh, one problem is the charcoal still didn't stay lit. So. <laughs> but it was fun while it lasted. It lasted not, so you know the point. So, he, so anyway, he, then he calls, he prays. The scripture says he prays out to God. Um, it says, Lord, uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. I have done all these things at your instructions. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so that these people will know that you, Lord, are the real God. And you can change their hearts. Then the Lord's fire fell. It consumed the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the dust. It even licked up the water in the trench. That's what my translation says. It even licked up the water in the trench. And so this powerful scene, this imagery, um, you know, if you just think about what it must have looked like. And I think, um, as I said, um, it reveals something to us about God. This fire from heaven, um, this fire from the Lord, it reveals to us a couple things about God. I think uh, we can get it all in verse 37. In verse 37. Answer me, Lord, answer me. So I think the first thing to think about what's being revealed here is that our God, the God of Israel, is a God that answers when we call out. Our God answers when we call out. Remember when the, when the uh, prophets of Jezebel were calling out? No answer. We were working on this actually this weekend. And Annika or Lydia uh, was in the room uh, at the point when I told Pastor Melissa, I said, yeah, I said now, I said, you know, in this process of trying to think of the message, I said, you know, we just got to remember, we have to call out. I said, let's call out on the name. Let's call out on the Holy Spirit. Let's call the Holy Spirit. And I looked up into the ceiling. But as I said, let's call the Holy Spirit. And Lydia was in the room and she said, there must not be anybody there. <laughs> I guess she was expecting, and she was very serious, very serious. So I guess she was expecting a voice from the ceiling to come down. And uh, so I imagine that, that must be what the prophets of Jezebel um, they must have felt the same thing. I mean, we're, nobody's answering. Uh, but our God is a God that answers out. And answers out when we call on the name of the Lord. And so that's evident. It's clear. It's easy to pick up there in 37. Answer me, Lord. Answer me. And, and the Lord answers in a spectacular way. You know, it does not answer in uh, any way that there could be any confusion in a spectacular way. The second thing that it reveals is that the Lord, in the same verse, so that the people will know that you, Lord, are the real God. You are the real God. So God, the God that we serve is the real God. Yahweh is the real God. That's revealed to us um, you know, through the story here that Elijah, um, of calling on the name of God and the fire coming down, that God is the real God. Now, uh, again, it wasn't unusual to have a whole list of gods here in the, in the biblical story, um, the foreign gods, the gods of the foreigners um, that had um, names like Asherah. Asherah was a, was a god, a goddess, and uh, Baal in this case, and, and just all around the land, all around the kingdoms, uh, there were, they, people had gods, and so that wasn't unusual. And so this competition sets us up the real God. Now we have uh, today many opportunities to have gods in our life, and not just um, deities from other world religions uh, that are named, um, but uh, God's little g that we make out of everyday life, idols and gods that, that we face every single day or that we create. Anything you call and I call on the name of, Anything we value uh, can become our God very quickly. And in fact, um, the word worship in English um, you know, really um, comes from a, an old English, Anglo-Saxon, Saxon, Saxon, say that easily, ten times, uh, word for worship, the same word that they use for worship means, you know, what, how much do you put a value, putting a value on something. So what we value 
can very quickly turn into a god, little g, or, or we can quickly worship. And I'm not going to go through a list of those because, you know, uh, each of us, you and I, have our own list of things that, if we're not careful, um, can become a worship for us and misplaced worship. And then the third thing uh, that is revealed about God uh, follows out of the first two, and it's the end of the verse, and it says that you can, that you can change their hearts. You can change their hearts. And so, in this case, what Elijah is saying is that I'm calling on your name because I know you're the real God, and the reason I'm doing it is because we need some changed hearts here in Israel. We need some changed hearts. That's the whole point. And so God acts in a fantastic way, a miraculous way, a supernatural way, because the objective of the acting, of the answering the call of Elijah, the objective is changed hearts. So Elijah's not calling out to be, uh, hey, I want a million dollars, Lord. I'm calling out on your name. Boom! Bang! Bunch of gold fell from heaven. That'd be dangerous, right? All right? That's not the story. God's not calling out for, hey, I want a beautiful wife. And boom, she falls, Melissa falls from heaven. <laughs> Got that? I'll take it. <laughs> so it's not anything like that. Not anything like that. Uh, you know, whatever you're, I want a new job. Boom. Braver insurance falls from heaven and <laughs> you can walk right in and apply and you got a job right away. Whatever the case, it's not that kind of stuff. You know, all those types of things certainly can be part of our prayer life. Uh, but what this story says is that God answers and God's real. And God does it in spectacular and real ways when the objective is a changed heart. And so this most powerful miracle that we have in the midst of this awful time in the story of the people of God is about changed hearts. God is, was in the business of changing hearts, even in the midst of all this terrible stuff that is going on. And so this is revealed about God. God answers, God's real, and God's in the heart-changing business. is revealed in this story of Elijah battling against the prophets of Jezebel. And so what I declare to us today, to me and you, what I declare is, uh, that good news from that scripture is still valid today. That God still answers when we call out on His name. God is still God, the real God, today. And most definitely, God is still in the heart-changing business. Amen? Now all of this in here, most of us in here, I don't know exactly, but most of us in here, I would bet that this week we're going to pray for lots of things. We're going to pray for um, a beautiful spouse to fall from heaven for our loved ones. I mean, Garth's prayer came true, right, Garth? Your mom prayed for you for many years, like she did me, and it came true. Your Melissa fell from heaven. All right? And so some of you might have prayers like that for your loved ones. Some of you are going to pray for financial um, stress release. And probably all of us, right? Yeah, we don't have any independently wealthy people in here, do we? Uh, so we'll probably all pray for some sort of financial issue. Uh, we'll pray for you know, our job and career things for either us or other people. But I would bet that most of us in here, if not all of us, will fail this week to pray for someone to have a changed heart. And we certainly won't pray for our own hearts. Because many of us will think we're lost causes. And that's a bad place to be as the people of God. Because God, in this scripture, reveals to us that he's in the heart-changing business. And God is still in that business today. But we don't do that. We don't pray for ourselves, our own hearts. Because again, we have a lot of times we think, well, we are who we are. You know, I've got this trait from my dad. I've got this trait from my mom. And I've been nurtured and brought up this way. I ain't changing. Anybody ever try to change somebody's mind about something? Especially if you're married and you have a spouse and you try to change your spouse's mind. I mean, and then let alone their heart. You know, we're trying to talk to uh, Monica about some choices that she has to make for in the fall. You know, activity type choices. And, you know, and you even bring up the subject to try to show her the way and the light and 
it's like, man, we got a long way to go to change her mind because her heart is so in so much in one place. And that's a hard thing to change. And then we start thinking about more important things in life like uh, how you behave and how you operate and where your heart is and whether it's with God or not. Um, a lot of times we feel like that's a lost cause. And we've given up on ourselves. I am who I am. Well, that's God's name, not yours. Amen? Amen? And we certainly give up a lot of times on loved ones. A mother never gives up on their loved ones. But all the rest of us in here, we give up on folks in our lives. And so we need to take on the prayer like a mom who never gives up and continues to pray for change hearts and their kids. My mom prayed for me for many years. I told you that before. I was at a wedding. This has nothing to do with the sermon. I was at a wedding yesterday. <laughs> or Friday. Friday was a Friday wedding. Two Friday weddings in a row. Uh, but anyway, I, it was my old college roommate's brother, little brother, was getting married. <laughs> so I married the little brother. And uh, But my college roommate was there, and another college roommate was there that I had seen recently, but I hadn't seen my the brother for a long time. And they get the biggest kick that I'm a pastor now. <laughs> because they know how I used to be. And it's like, they just think it's comical. And it's like, it's as if they want to take the mic and uh, tell everybody how I used to be. <laughs> and everybody there already knows, because it's all family and friends. But it's a changed heart. And you got to pray for a changed heart for you and for others. Because God's still in the heart-changing business. God is still in the heart-changing business. It's revealed to us in this scripture today. And it's revealed to us every day. And the kicker is that even after you've given your heart to the Lord, even after you've given your heart to the Lord, you know, that change is not complete. It's not over. You don't just say, all right, I'm changed. And then I give up, or not give up, I'm changed, I'm in. I punched my ticket. Now I can just move on about my life. No, it's a continuous process. It's called sanctification. You're, it's continuing. It's all the way. The rest of your life will be working, you and I, on our hearts being changed and, and developing and being more Christ-like. You have to pray about it every day. Every, when you wake up in the morning, pray and check in and say, Lord, you know where my heart is today. Not physically, not physically, but emotionally and spiritually. You know where my heart is. And wherever it is, let's take it up a notch. And I'm going to give it over to you. Fill my heart with the Spirit of God. One of the things that Pastor Melissa and I do as the day unfolds or the week and we're, we to encourage one another. If she's going to a, a meeting or or getting, I'll, I always have to coach her. We'll turn the mic off. I always have to coach her about when she goes to write an email or to go on the phone. I was like, you know, because she wants to get right to the point. She's very prophetic that way. She's like Elijah. And I was like, I was like, just give him Jesus. Just give him Jesus. Give him Jesus. And when you think about, and she does the same for me. I was just kidding. So when you're thinking about giving somebody Jesus, even if you're going to, might not have the news they want to hear, if you're doing it from a place where you're trying to give them Jesus first and the bad news second, then it's hard to be a jerk. But if you forget, and I forget, that God's in the heart-changing business, so we give up, we say, well, this is just the way it has to be, but this is the way it is. And you can be a jerk just like anybody else can, and I can too. And it's a dangerous place to be. So my prayer is that we all realize that God answers our call to Him. God is real. And God is still in the heart-changing business. And so our prayer life this week should be calling out to God to change our hearts first, or continue to change our hearts. <laughs> And then for other people that are in our lives as well, change their hearts. Don't give up on anybody that's around you. Pray for God to change their hearts. And it's all, and God, God wants to. God is already working in their lives. Even if it doesn't show any fruit, God's working in their lives. And so I pray that they see it and they can feel it. And that their heart can be transformed too. Because if you don't believe it, if you don't believe God can change somebody's heart, Yours included. Then you're wasting your time with Christianity. Because it's the whole point. It's the whole point. That we serve God. 
that so loved us, even though we didn't deserve it, sent his son Jesus the Christ to die for us. And that's a transaction. That's a heart transaction, all based on love. And that same spirit that lived and worked through Jesus is available to us. And if that spirit gets into our heart somehow, if it penetrates this toughness, look how tough my chest is. <laughs> Working out and working out. I mean, if it can get through that muscle, and it can get through anybody's, that's the whole point. So don't give up on anybody in your life. You certainly don't give up on yourself. Because God still wants to work in our hearts today. And that's revealed to us in this miracle story of Elijah and the prophets of Jezebel fighting it out over the fire coming down light that pool up and God won in a magnificent way because God likes to be called out he'll answer God's real and God wants to change hearts. Amen? Amen. Amen.